we are good to go. Thank you. Uh, so I'd like to acknowledge that we live and work on the land, the unceded land of the Dena'ina people and thank them for their past, present and future stewardship uh, for the land on which we live. Can we go ahead and start the roll call, please? I'll take care of that. Um, Chair Rodriguez. Present. Vice Chair King. Present. I know he's here. Miss Brawley. Hi, I'm here. Ms. Hobson. Here. Ms. Hotch. Here. Mr. Clouda. Here. Ms. McConnell. Here. Mr. Miner is excused. Mr. Smallwood. Here. Did I get everyone? Okay, Madam Chair, you have a quorum. Fantastic. Can I uh, get a motion to approve the agenda? So moved, this is Nolan. Thank you. Any discussion of, of the agenda before we before we move? Oh, do you need a second? This is Anna. Yes, actually, thank you. I <laughs> have to appreciate that, Anna. OK, <laughs> no worries. now do we have any discussion? <laughs> OK, hearing none, I think I believe it's moved. Um, OK, so we'll move on to the assembly report. My apologies, I can't. Let me see, who do we have from the assembly here today? Hi, I'm here, okay. Suzanne. Good morning, thank you. Good morning. Um, should I go ahead and begin? Yes, please. Okay, thanks so much. Um, thanks for this opportunity. I very much appreciate the invitation and uh, also your involvement in this process for um, considering how to distribute the American Rescue Plan funding. And I just want to say too, I'm confident I speak for the entire assembly when I say we very much value your input and your willingness to contribute your expertise to this effort. So thank you so much. Um, I'll cover three things. I'll go over the process and then touch on some of the main funding considerations that have emerged from some of the work sessions so far. And then, um, end with a specific request that one of the members made for um, the BAC to consider. And, and Nolan, you may have already discussed that with the group, but I would love to get some feedback on that. So first off, as far as the process goes, um, the assembly is fully committed to a thorough public process. We totally want to identify how best to distribute the 101 million or so dollars coming directly to the municipality. And I think that's pretty clear from the schedule that the chair has put together and the efforts to solicit feedback from members of the community and from people who have tried to access some of the uh, funds of the, the programs from the last round of funding. So the focus is you know, on stabilizing and recovering the survive, adapt, thrive, and what we need to do. And um, a couple things that emerge very quickly is that we want to get the money out fast where it's needed using any effective existing structures that we already have. And we want to identify the gaps and the other funding sources. We definitely do not want to duplicate any of the federal programs or programs that we expect will be funded with the state of Alaska's $1 billion. And though that's, you know, a, a, that's difficult because it will take them some time to go through the allocation process as well. And we want to use the priority framework that we developed, that the assembly developed from that first round of COVID-19 relief funds. Um, and I don't know, have all of you seen that or received that framework? I just sent it out to Alyssa and uh, Lance before the meeting. I think we can get that shared out if, if we haven't had it. We may not have had a chance to share it yet, but we'll make sure we get someone that. is speaking. We cannot hear them other than Suzanne. Oh, sorry. This is this is Alyssa. I was trying to say we did get it, uh, Suzanne. But um, OK, for that, we go ahead and, and get that out to the to the body. OK, thanks. Yeah, and um, well, I don't I know if take I take care of that. I can you put it up, that. Lance? Would you be able to put it up on the screen? I, I think um, 
I can. Okay. Hold on. Great. I think somebody's doing it. I have it up. Thank you, oh, Lila. Thank you so You're much. Welcome. Okay, so we started actually our work session discussions with taking a look at this framework and whether or not it's still uh, viable for this next round. And so this framework will continue to come up throughout the discussion. I'll reference it probably a few times today, but um, it shows the priorities and those are not in the order of importance, the ones at the top from left to right, but those are the areas right that were identified. And then the timeline is this you know, short term or long term, some of the guiding principles and then um, some definitions there in the yellow box below and what um, those areas at the top, those priorities mean. Okay, so we'll be using that priority framework um, as we consider potential allocations. And just a little bit more in the process, as I mentioned, um, Chair Rivera set out a pretty rigorous schedule of work sessions and town halls. We had one on March 19th, we had one on March 26th. And during those sessions, we've heard from a number of community members representing different segments, um, tourism, small business owners, hospitality and retailers, Chamber of Commerce, AEDC, nonprofits, um, et cetera. And we've got the third work session and town hall scheduled for tomorrow, Friday, April 9, from 5 to 9.30 p.m. in the chambers, and it will also be streamed as well. Uh, we're still in the brainstorming and imagining phase. And so some of the folks we'll be hearing from tomorrow. Oh, Alyssa is on the list representing the BAC and Alaska MEP. She'll be joined by Bruce Bustamante, Chamber of Commerce, John Bittner, Alaska SBDC, Lori Wolf, Foraker Group, Isaac Vandenberg, Launch Alaska, Kirk Rose, ACLT. So we'll hear from them and have the opportunity to ask questions. And there will also be an opportunity for public testimony as well. Um, we're still waiting on guidance from the federal departments. Lance could best speak to that, but hopefully we'll hear something next week or the week after. Our goal for the meeting tomorrow, or the chair has indicated that he would like us to put together a draft allocation plan and then get that out for public review so that in April and May, we can take that um, draft plan and do some outreach in our individual assembly districts. Uh, there will also be then, let's see, on May 12th, a regular assembly meeting and possibly then uh, a resolution to introduce or an ordinance with these allocations on Friday, May 21st at noon, there'll be a work session and town hall in the chambers to review and, and discuss the resolution or ordinance with those allocations. And then on Tuesday, May 25th, at uh, the regular assembly meeting, it's expected that there will be a public hearing and vote on the resolution or ordinance um, with those allocations. And of course, this is all subject to what we learn from the federal government concerning the rules and the allocations. But again, we'll be using this framework that we developed to create and evaluate proposals. Um, just to touch briefly on the proposals, we've been asked to provide to come tomorrow with a description of what it is, where it fits in this framework. Is it you know, long-term, short-term funding or both? What's the potential cost? What are the guiding principles? Who are the collaborators? And then I think also, um, what are the deliverables are important too? That's a question that has come up. Um, what can the, what's going to be the output? What can the community expect uh, to get from the proposal and so on? So some considerations so far, and again, we've been soliciting input from members of the community and then um, soliciting feedback on how the programs went. We want to know what worked, what didn't work. And again, we want to get the money out fast to where it's needed using any existing structures that work the first time around. Um, clearly identifying those gaps will be difficult um, 
because we don't we don't have all the details, especially at the state level. Don't know yet how they're going to spend their money, and um, there are still some details forthcoming with some federal programs too, which you know will cover rental support, childcare support, restaurant revitalization. Okay, uh, the plan is to quickly allocate 10 million to 25 million of the first tranche that, um, and I don't know if this has already been discussed, but the 101 million will be divided into two tranches. And Lance, please um, correct me on anything because I know you've been much more closely involved with that piece of it. But 250, great. oh, sorry, what was that? I said you're doing great. Oh, well, thank you. So two $50 million tranches. The first one, I want to say within 60 days of the program uh, being created, and then the second one the next year or 12 months afterwards. Is that, is that about right, Lance? Yes, I think the first one we would know maybe in late May. Um, okay. I don't know about the, the, the second one. I, I can't recall. Okay. Okay. My recollection is it's about a year. So um, what has emerged so far on that quick allocation is to clear the waiting list because some of the programs um, with that first, those first rounds of CARES Act monies were oversubscribed, such as the Small Business Relief Program, Nonprofit Relief, Relief for Artists and Musicians, and the Voucher Gift Card Program. Um, that one, we have the most specific information right now. I think about 11,000 people oversubscribed. It would cost about two and a half million to um, get gift cards out to that group. Um, as far as like rental relief, that's come up as a question. That's an area where, you know, federal money actually may be available and we may or may not need to to supplement that locally. Hopefully we won't need to. Hopefully um, the federal dollars will be enough. There has also been um, some support expressed for getting some tourism marketing and tourism business relief funds out quickly since um, the tourism season is about to start and maintaining some funding for the cultural pillars, technical assistance to business, outreach and education, the outreach piece, and I know um, the administration is also working on this um, for in a couple ways. One, to make sure that um, our local folks, individuals and businesses are able to access the federal and state funding opportunities, and then to ensure that we're doing effective local outreach. And I thought that um, some of the feedback at the March 26 meeting, raising the issue of equity, and that when you're doing, you know, first come, first serve, like for the voucher program, someone who can use a computer can apply very quickly versus um, someone who, you know, needs to print it out and um, get it mailed or delivered. Um, and I thought that was a really great point that they raised. And so outreach to involve advertising, maybe some street teams as well to make sure people know about programs and are able to apply. Intensive case management um, is also up for consideration in that early round of funding. And there's been a lot of conversation about workforce training and, and thank you to Nolan for your presentation at the meeting. I appreciated what you said about taking a more targeted approach and taking a look at workforce development through scholarships, marketing anchorage, supporting startups, and then also, you know, keeping a focus on vaccinating. Um, Kai Holland also presented on March 26, and he suggested that 5%, about 5 million, go to support entrepreneurship and innovation. I would really love to get um, the feedback from all of you on, on that idea. He had some specifics for what that would cover. Um, that would include, you know, activities, training programs, analysis, grants for pr proposals, and then also renting space virtually and also a, a physical brick and mortar space as well. So 
I will go ahead then and um, move on to the specific request that um, member Constant made to the Budget Advisory Commission members. And his question was, given all the federal and potential state programs, what should we not fund? We've talked a lot about um, you know, what we should fund, what do we specifically not want to fund? We want to use our um, our money to fund programs we can realistically do. And again, there is tremendous concern about duplication, and that definitely presupposes that we have information about the other programs. And I think that's that's a really big challenge. And I'm not sure how you know we're going to need to piece that together and, and stay up on those changes. And then I would also ask if um, if any of you have specific proposals as well, um, even though the chair has asked us to bring those to tomorrow's meeting, we definitely have some time before you know this comes before us in May, you know, to make changes to add and re refine. So please don't let the um, the timeline hold you back. We'd love to to hear your feedback and if you you have questions or if there's information that you all need as well. So I will stop there, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. And again, thank you all so very much um, for your willingness to engage and lend your expertise to this process. Thank you very much, Suzanne. We really appreciate the, the summary and, and going through really the process that the assembly is, is gonna work through to try to make sure that these funds are dispersed in the, the best way possible. And um, I, we we had a small conversation um, with some folks within uh, within the municipality to try to get some help on on that gap analysis, and so we've got some time right now on our agenda um, to kind of talk through this. And so I think before I I start talking about um, that, I want to make sure that Anna and James have a chance to um, to weigh in since you guys have been so wonderfully patient. Um, pr really appreciate it. Anna, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Um, yeah, and I have. Um, well, I, I emailed some some thoughts already to the assembly, just as an individual. Um, so I will I will take you up on that offer if I have other ideas. But um, but I had two questions, um, which I, I understand you guys are still in the the process. The first one is, have you identified kind of a general um, split or or thought on any uh, allocation of that short term versus long term like is it can you know are you thinking half and half obviously the money itself is being dispersed into two tranches like you said but um but i guess i would put in a plug for thinking long term you know as a planner i'm, I'm interested certainly in in that immediate relief for people but it sounds like there's a lot of money out there um you know especially directly that's going to go to that purpose so that's one question is the short-term long-term um breakdown and then also given that the state has is going to be getting you know what like 10 times as much money as as the muni um and it's not all going to go to anchorage certainly but um but i wonder what kind of proactive communication you guys are planning to the legislature is there they're starting to dig into this question and um and I think you can make a lot of cases like our port or other, you know, infrastructure that needs to be um, attention paid attention to. So thanks. Thank you, Anna. Really appreciate that. And I, I like that you brought up the the short term versus long term. That was a big part of the conversation that we were having yesterday on this topic, um, Nolan and and uh, Jonathan and myself, and and really trying to take advantage of the fact that uh, Lance and Suzanne, I believe this. Funding doesn't have to be spent until 2025. I don't know if I'm if I'm right or um, if any if I'm wrong. Can somebody please correct me? But that gives us a nice amount of time to really be thoughtful about it and to understand, you know, what are some of those big barriers to um, to Anchorage's economy to to really focus a decent portion of the money on the long term, while not neglecting the importance of spending quickly, uh, the pressure to spend quickly, and then of course those acute needs that are still very much related to, to COVID. So I really appreciate you, you bringing up that short versus long term. That was something that I was hoping that um, would be brought up and, and that we could talk about. Uh, James, do you want to go ahead? Hi, uh, and good morning. I guess it's still good morning or almost good afternoon. Um, I just got a kind of a, a question here. I, I know, uh, Suzanne, you said that you guys haven't really hashed out 
where the money is really going to be allocated um, under your priorities. But I'm just kind of curious when it comes to mental health, has that already been addressed? Is that part of the public health and safety? And also, um, as far as economic stimulus um, with funds going to small businesses, um, will some of that, <clears throat> excuse me, will some of that funds uh, specifically address uh, probably their need to um, uh, continue on with their health insurance, uh, their employer coverage too, um, in that area? Um, I, hopefully, you, hopefully it's been brought up. If not, then I definitely want to bring that up, especially with the mental health. And I and I hope that would be under um, long term or something that that um, um, I'll be there for a while. Uh, just because I do think that um, this COVID has affected uh, a lot of people's mental health um, last year. Thank you for that, James. That's a, a great piece of uh, feedback and suggestion. And I, I will admit not something that I had thought of from a small business perspective. So thank you for that. Um, I want to open it up to everybody to, to spend some time to talk about uh, this topic and any any thoughts you'll have. I'll, I'll summarize quickly um, some of the points from the conversation that we had yesterday. So we are going to get, like I mentioned before, we are going to get some help in terms of actually doing um, kind of a, a gap analysis on ARPA itself. And then one of the um, one of the other things that we talked about was, Suzanne, to, to echo your point, looking at what do we expect the state will fund? The state was pretty slow in, in um, funding things with the CARES funds. And so it might be that we perhaps still need to fund things that we expect that the state will fund just in order to um, address things more quickly. But also just having that in our minds, what do we think the state will and won't fund so that we can know uh, what this what the muni should prioritize and to um, to Chris Constance point, what, what should we not fund because someone else is going to cover it? Um, one of the other things that we had discussed was um, Thinking, thinking long term, what is it that that we really need to address in order to help Anchorage not just come back to the place that we were pre pandemic, but to invest in making Anchorage Anchorage better and our uh, our economy better and hopefully hopefully different than it was when we entered into COVID-19 because it's not like we were doing well pre, pre COVID. So there's some really fundamental fundamental issues there. And, and to that point, uh, workforce development, workforce training and retraining had come up. Um, I know I'm missing a, a few points there. Uh, Jonathan uh, and Nolan, would you like to weigh in on and, and help, help remind me of some of the things that we discussed yesterday that that you think uh, should be brought up here? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in, uh, Madam Chair. <clears throat> um, I, I think that that, you know, in, in this case, the opportunity to uh, to be um, you know, fairly thoughtful, methodical, and and to and to not and to focus the funding on areas where, especially where the where other parts of the federal legislation are putting money to, and and you know, um, Assemblymember LaFrance, you know, you mentioned things like some of the housing assistance doesn't doesn't necessarily mean that that you know we shouldn't put any local monies towards that, but we should make sure, but we should look and see if there are gaps in that in, as far as who's covered and who isn't, and I think I think it's important to, uh, to we have the opportunity to focus some of the funding. A bit more thoughtfully there. I think I think I, I like that a lot. That does also suggest some level of of understanding or coordination with what the state is funding too, because it's the same type of issue as well, where we're we can't pour all of our same um, you know we can't we can't give all the same organizations funding for all the same purposes. And um, um, so I mean, th those are a couple of the couple of the thoughts. So we think that that you know calling it a gap analysis, but it's it's really something where we're you know thoughtfully laying out what's being covered. And um, and and where the opportunities for you know more investment should go. Thank you very much, Nolan. I appreciate that. And something that that you reminded me of um, is and and uh, Suzanne, you you touched on this as well when you were talking about outreach. Is is there's so many different types of federal funding that's going to become available? Um, so not just through ARA and this particular pot of funds, but through FEMA and and other you know, other other departments that to the extent that we could creatively use uh, ARPA funds to cover um, typical municipal functions um, and free up that that money to then hire someone who can leverage um, leverage that, so to speak, and who can help us go out and recognize some of those other funding sources that will become available. Um, Suzanne, you'd mentioned 
Oh, I think you'd mentioned homelessness. Now I'm, I'm trying to go back and look at my notes, but but that there will be funds coming out for these or already are available for for some of these big initiatives that are that are listed high up on the priorities. And to the extent that we can free up the time of, of municipal employees to seek out those funds, apply for those funds, etc. Um, that could be a really great way of of utilizing a, a very small portion of these funds to um, to expand what we're able to bring into the city and uh, and accomplish more. Jonathan, please please jump in. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. And just reflecting back to our discussion yesterday, and, and I've got a couple a couple of thoughts, which is, um, you know, I, I hear a lot of focus on 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 fast, and I, and and. I think that we will have to pay a certain amount of homage to the, to, you know, to the gods of fast and quick, um, because that was, I mean, that was a criticism of of the prior round and certainly a challenge. But at the same time, I, I really want to caution us to not fight the last war. That we need to fight the the battle that's in front of us, as opposed to the battle that we just fought. And um, and that means, you know, really thinking through this and being intentional about it, because. There is a really high potential for inefficient um, inefficient use of funds and and wasteful use of funds if we're just focused on, you know, get it get it out there quickly. Um, in, the next thing is is to be aware of flooding. There's unless you're just going to do wholesale cash handouts, um, there's just only so much capacity within a, a population of of three hundred thousand. Um, to absorb and utilize money at at, at any given time, um, and I know that there are multiple organizations in the city that are already getting calls from state agencies saying we're going to have all this money and we don't have the internal capacity to deal with it. Do you have the internal capacity to run the programs? And those organizations are looking around, going, "This is just an amazing amount of money. I I don't know how we're." I, We'd love to, but but capacity is not there. So the ability to push money into the system, unless you're just handing out cash, is is relatively limited. And of course, the, the more you just hand out cash, the more likely it is that you're going to have, uh, in some ways, an, an inefficient result. We do need some of that, but we need to be thoughtful about um, about what we're thinking. And and I think you know, kind of going back about don't fight the last war. I, you know, I have clients right now in the in the restaurant sector, and many of them are telling me that they are back to seasonal, nearly back to seasonal norm, that they're within single digit percentages of what they would consider to be normal traffic. And they're actually having challenges in terms of scaling up because the biggest challenge right now is not is not clients coming in the door. It's having the staff to appropriately service them. Um, so I just want us to be make sure that's certainly not going to be the case for every restaurant, and certainly some of those businesses are are still struggling. But just to be aware that the conditions now are not the conditions from last summer, and and for us to just be to be thoughtful around that stuff. So thank thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to to kind of express those thoughts. Thank you very much, Jonathan. I, I appreciate that. I You brought up some really wonderful points that I, I made notes about over here that I'd forgotten uh, to bring up when I was trying to make a summary. So thank you. Uh, really appreciate that. Um, Anna, and, and I, I actually, let me, I'll read Carla's comment. Carla made a comment um, that business is good, but she can't find the staff. So I, yeah, thank you for, for sharing that, Carla. Uh, Anna, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, and I, I appreciate what Jonathan said and that kind of look at how things are right now. I know um, business is still slow for a lot of people, but um, but yeah, it, it does seem like just the number of cars on the road suggests that people are ready to get back to normal. And I guess another concept to throw out there is um, the idea of like a, a catalyst. And I know, um, so I'm also participating in the roadmap, roadmap to the vital and safe Anchorage group. That's a bunch of um, kind of private sector folks who are trying to figure out, um, you know, how to revitalize downtown, um, how to make it, make it easier to do business. So part of it is that, again, short term, but thinking long term um, and trying to get to where we want to be as a community because um, we, you know, we're not there yet. So um, 
so in terms of catalyst, I mean, what we've been discussing, at least at the downtown level, is is really just getting people downtown, you know, so so the, that's the critical uh, critical path item, you know, because <laughs> um, once people are there, they'll they'll um, liven up the street, you know, they'll they'll convince other people that it's safe to be downtown or fun to be downtown. Um, there's a lot of events being planned, um, but really so so it's helpful to think about those other kind of catalyst um places to focus, which is, you know, if we, if we can get kind of a virtuous cycle of people going back downtown, spending money downtown, bringing those activities and that life downtown, um, you know, tourists and residents, obviously. Um, so I don't I don't know what the other kind of catalyst points are, but I think that's a really good way to think about this, this kind of one time infusion of funding. Thank, thank you, Anna. I really appreciate that. And I, um, I think that to some degree speaks to, you know, there were there were efforts to kind of revitalize downtown and whatnot before COVID. They've definitely become much more acute uh, since COVID, but I, I really want to kind of emphasize or build upon the point of there are issues that we had pre-COVID and to the extent that we can, that it's allowable to use these funds to, to work on some of those issues. And, and one that comes to mind is supply chains. That is, it's a COVID issue, but it was also a big issue for Alaskans you know, Alaskan businesses in general pre COVID. And to the extent that we have the time and the flexibility within these funds to really address some of those fundamental issues, which I, I, I think um, downtown, the, the uh, concerns about downtown and, and revitalization have been around for, for quite some time. So I, I would kind of in my mind lump those into some fundamental issues that, that this would be a wonderful opportunity for all, you know, or maybe I should say the handful of things that we have always lamented um, in Anchorage and in Alaska that if only we had, you know, millions upon millions of dollars, we could solve this problem. Well, now we do. And to what extent are some of those problems part of what are what are listed as those priorities? Or do we really need to think about and go back to, you know, the binders upon binders of um, economic research that, you know, maybe Nolan has in his office and things like that and say, OK, which one of these issues appears in every single one of these studies? that we now have potentially the, the money to address, especially if we can bridge that gap between a fundamental issue for our economy and and an impact um, for COVID. <laughs> Nolan says, I do have some thick binders of reports. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, with that, I, I want to open it up again. Any um, Any other comments from folks that we haven't heard from yet, especially? And any other, um, you know, kind of looking at these priorities, I think, um, you know, we will be spending a lot more time discussing this and um, and kind of talking about what the BAC wants, you know, in a resolution and wants to put forth as suggestions and things like that. So to the extent that you have information from your community, from your business, those sorts of things, I think this is a, a good time to bring it up or you can keep it in the back of your mind as, as, these, as we continue this conversation. Uh, Nolan, go ahead, please. Um, yeah, thank thank you, Madam Chair. I, I was I was going to say, um, Assemblymember LaFrance, that uh, one one aspect of this, and I, I definitely appreciate and and you know endorse what what Jonathan is saying about you know not not fighting the last battle because I think there you know we we are faced with kind of different circumstances right now. Um, uh, but but it but with with that in mind, I I am wondering. I think something for the assembly to consider a little bit is 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 in the in the cares distribution. You know there were quite a few programs that were spun up um, and uh, to to distribute funding. You know some of those programs are you know that you mentioned were oversubscribed. Um, in in a few cases, you know it it may make sense to think about which of those programs were really effective that may have some ongoing need and uh, and and continuing those too. And which which of those programs are the best candidates to to continue some funding? You know um, and especially since. You know, programmatic infrastructure was already built up, and and perhaps in in some cases, money could be distributed, you know, thoughtfully through those. Um, so that's another thing to think about. Thank you, Nolan. I that's a that's a really wonderful point, and and we have a lot of data. It's, is my understanding, especially on, um, you know, things like uh, the rental assistance and and different programs like that. So that's a a great point um, about utilizing the data that we have, and especially you know to the extent that we can analyze some some trends and um, is to determine is there still a really strong need in some of these different areas. OK, any any other comments, questions, random thoughts, even any any feedback that you have on. Um, on. Us, our, our collective work on this 
the ARPA funds. ARPA funds. All right, hearing none, uh, let's let's head over to our next agenda item. Uh, Lance or, or Lila, would you be able to pop up the agenda again? I can, just a moment. Thanks so much. All right, ah, Anchorage, Anchorage School District. Do we have Andy on the line? My apologies, I didn't see. Yes, I'm here. Hi, thanks, Andy. Uh, feel free to, to take it away. All right, I don't have a whole lot for you. Just kind of give you an update on where we're at. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you guys for the or the resolution you guys put forth to the assembly for the school district budget. Uh, we did get that passed uh, last or whatever the last meeting in March was for the assembly. So that went well. Um, secondly, you know, things that have happened since the last time we met is our secondary schools have started back to in person school and that's been going uh, very exceedingly well, really. Um, kind of one of the hiccups we've had was with the Alaska Native Cultural Charter School. I'm not sure how many of you guys are aware, but we ended up moving that's though that population into the Betty Davis East High School, East Anchorage High School to be able to uh, resume in person in person as well. The facility that Alaska Native was in was just subpar and the ventilation issues we had uh, didn't meet any sort of you know minimum guidelines to be able to have students in those classrooms. So we were able to pull them out and move them to east and uh, so they're going in person as well. Uh, I don't know that they have any plans to go back to that to really to that location. So we're trying to find them a suitable long term solution in the coming year or so. Um, aside from that, we're becoming uh, grant managers for the ESER 2 and ESER 3 funds within the SIRSA Act and the ARP Act. We have received the ESER 2 allocation from the state. It's about $50 million, and I think we had this on the last meeting as well. But uh, by and large, that's going towards teachers to maintain our present class size, some IT equipment and uh, personnel, as well as uh, a large summer school. And so we're really that 50 million is almost uh, all allocated out. It'll go to the board in a couple of weeks for approval and then we'll submit our application to the state. Um, the ESER 3 with the ARP Act will be, we don't know how much our allocation is going to be for that. We anticipate it being in the 100 million, 115 million dollar range. Uh, it just kind of depends on how the state divvies that out on our Title I uh, status. So we we'll expect that in the next you know, several weeks to come out and then start kind of uh, developing a long range plan around that because we have until September of 24 to spend those funds. So really that's, uh, oh, and then the, the last thing I had was we are, I don't know if you've seen the summer school plans, but they are uh, opening up a robust summer school program to help get folk or kids caught back up from uh, to where they need to be. The, the ones who have uh, lost out on some of their education or feel like they're behind, we're going to you know, have every opportunity we can to have those folks get back into schools over the summer and get caught up. We'll have two sessions, one in towards the end of June and one at the beginning of July. So if you have if you have kids that need to or would like to go to summer school or know families that would, please recommend them to go to the website and you know sign up. I think that it'll, it'll be open to sign up here. If it's not open already, it should be open in the next couple of weeks. So with that, uh, entertain any questions if anyone has them. Thanks, Andy. Uh, James has a question or comment. Yeah, um, just a quick question. So with the with the um, Alaska Native Charter College or Charter School leaving um, their building, I noticed that their old building is for sale. Is that a ASD building, and and uh, is that profit that you expect coming in or? Uh, no, sir. That facility is owned by Pacific Northern Academy PNA. Uh, so oh, it's okay, not so a ASD facility, so we don't have uh, the ability to actually go in there and make those repairs. But I believe that facility has been for sale for quite some time. Um, but it just needs a whole lot of work done to it to make it a suitable location for schools. So are, are you thinking about, um, um, I know they're over at East right now, but are you thinking about permanently put them in a different school building or what's, what's the long term? Um, we, you know, we really haven't got that far. Ideally, they would have their uh, own location. I mean, it's a fairly large school, so I don't know that we have a whole lot of, 
I guess age appropriate schools because these, you know, it's not I, ideal to have kindergartners, first graders in there. You know, you have to have uh, modify the bathroom so they can reach the toilets, right? I mean, there's there's a lot of things that just don't work for the for the smaller population. But um, yeah, I mean, we're just right now just get them in, get school started, and try to consider options over the next year. I think we anticipate having them in East at least next year. Allow them to save up some money and even you know do a a build to suit type thing like Rilke Shula and Winterberry did, or to find other some some other property that they can can be renovated easily enough to meet their needs. Okay, thank you. Looks like we have a question from Jonathan or comment. Yeah, just a, a comment and and maybe saying through Andy, um, you know. Uh, that um, just thank you to all the staff, um, you know, both ed the educational staff and the administrative staff uh, for the efforts to get kids back to the secondary school kids back to school safely. I have two secondary school children um, and they are both working really hard uh, and both happy to, to be able to see their friends on a daily basis. Uh, and so just a shout out because it's an opportunity to make a shout out to all the people that have helped um, make that happen. It, it has, you know, it's not perfect, but um, it is benefiting the kids. And so just thank you for the effort going into it. I'll pass that along. It was, there was a, with the Alaska Native, it was a really heavy lift for our warehouse and all the this teaching staff at both schools to really get their stuff out of the classrooms that the, the new school is going to occupy. Then the to move all that things over over the course of spring break you know they did it in a few days moving an entire school to a new a new one so it was really just an incredible job that our uh warehouse staff did to get them moved over our maintenance staff to get those facilities accomplished and you know so far back to school for those secondary students that it is going pretty well and most of the folks we talked to are really enjoying being back and seeing their friends it's still not ideal you know because they only have the three classes and they're not they don't have that the lunch time or break the passing time like they did so it's not it's not ideal for the friends but they do get to see them in class and make those social connections that they need yeah my, my child our youngest child is in a building that the ventilation system is not capable of meeting the standards to allow them to eat inside so they are required to eat outside while passing between classes it's it's not ideal. I mean, that I've got a 13 year old that comes home and has lunch at 2.30 because 2, 2.30 because that's when the time allows to eat. But we, you know, we recognize that um, we all just have to be a little flexible in this moment and that hopefully September will be a different story. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Thanks, Andy and, and Jonathan. Andy, we, we appreciate all the work that you guys have been doing to to make this happen and get kids back in school and um, and it, it's been a, an amazing effort. Um, so I just want to express some appreciation for all that you've done um, and, and ASD has done in general to cope throughout this entire process. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, we're happy to get them back too. So you know, I've got my own kids going back, and it's uh, they're a lot happier going back too. <laughs> Any any other questions for for Andy? All right, seeing none, uh, we'll move on to OMB. Lance, you want to chat with us? Oh, real quick, looks like we've got a we've got a chat. Okay, um, Suzanne has a comment here. Uh, um, I'll let Lance take it away, and then we can all kind of read Suzanne's comment here and see if I need to read it into the record too. Lance, take us away. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I have a couple things on the agenda. Uh, the first one is how we are doing on the 2020 year end projections um, for revenues and expenses. Um, the uh, books are, I would just say, about 95% done. We're trying to wrap up um, some outstanding issues regarding the final sale of MLMP, but I think everything else is coming together. Um, uh, overall, where we ended the year, I think we're at I think we're going to be around 95% spent. Um, the thing that gives me a little bit of a uh, pause on that is I think we're going to be pretty close, but I need to verify um, the, the spend on the tax side of the house because a lot of departments um, or some departments received some federal dollars outside the CARES funds and they use that to either support uh, uh, their operations. But um, so I think 
at the end of the day, uh, overall departments will have underspent the amount of tax dollars that they had uh, applied to them. Um, I do have a couple departments that I know are going to be overspent. Police and fire collectively overspent by about seven million. Um, together, I can't recall the breakdown. And then I have a couple other departments that are over by a, a little bit. Um, but so the labor for the municipality is probably going to be around 103, but the non-labor is going to be closer to about 87 percent. 87 percent spent. Um, and so as soon as we get that final and reconciled, we will be sure to share that. I was really hoping that I would be able to do that today based on where we were a month ago, but um, regrettably I'm not. And Assemblymember LaFrance, this is the, uh, instead of giving you a December report and a year-end report, we're just going to give you a year-end report. And this one will include the year-end for the utilities, which I think as I recall my last look, they all they as well are looking pretty good. So again, proud of the departments for managing collectively. There are some departments that are significantly underspent, um, uh, but I'll be, be looking to see how those uh, how those actually turn out. Um, you will also see that we uh, had a lot of overtime and I think that had to do in a lot of overtime in our labor. And you will see that in departments, either in police, fire, health, and in financing. I mean, you'll see it in us, you'll see it in the controller. And a lot of that has to do with managing the CARES funds that have come in the door and managing those. So collectively, I think we're going to have a, a solid end. And again, um, I look forward to sharing the details with you as soon as that uh, I'm comfortable with them and that we've got all of the the tax dollars identified separated from any CARES funds or uh, fund, federal funds that departments may have received. Um, Transit received a bunch of it as an example. So again, and I've been, I think I've been sharing with the BAC that I did expect police and fire to go over a little bit. Um, I was not surprised to see that that became the case. We had, I also mentioned, you're gonna see some new ones in there and it has to do with leave cash out. We give departments a little bit of leave, budget for leave cash out every year. They were not able to take leave. And so um, they had to cash some out because they're only allowed to carry so much on the books. Many, um, many employees are that way. And so when they're close to their max and they can't, they can't use it, they cash it out. And obviously this year was not, uh, not consistent with the three year average. So. Looking forward to sharing that with you, Madam Chair. And if you have questions about departments, I'll be glad to try to address those now. Thanks, Lance. I, I believe we have a question. Uh, or Jonathan, did did you have a question? You want to? Yeah, Madam Chair, I took my hand down once I noted your uh, your message. Um, Lance, could could you just give the the one sentence or two sentence answer about? Uh, why the underspend on the non labor side? It felt like that was a, a, a bigger gap. And if that's something you just want us to wait until the report is done, uh, please just that's OK, too. Yeah, I can. Um, I think, yes, let me do that, because a lot of the non labor came to the departments in the in the in the share of um, some cares funds, for example, real estate. Um, they were provided the dollars to prov to um, buy the treatment center. So at the time of this report, um, that's an example I need to make sure that that's correct. And the other one that's sticking out at me is the muni manager. Um, but that one has to do with probably um, our uh, risk department. And uh, so anyway, let me let me refine that and get you an answer. But yeah, there's a couple outstanding ones that are pointing out to me. HR being another one, obviously didn't spend as much non labor as they had. And then um, IT is another example. OK, I thank you. So. You bet. Thank Good question. Thank you. So if there's no more questions, uh, 
Madam Chair, I'm going to go ahead and move on to first quarter budget revision status. Please do. Yeah. Okay. So um, we are uh, very much into the decision making processes back and forth with the administration based on the information that we have. Uh, one of the key pieces of information we have is um, that we were looking for was a fund balance number. And we got that on Tuesday afternoon from the CFO. So we have some questions about how that uh, looks. I think, you know, one of the things that we see in there is um, all of the the we, we basically have used our local cash dollars, our cash pool to respond to the earthquake that happened. You know, we're um, still responding to being buying things in, in relate to the earthquake, primarily at SWS solid waste services. We also through emergency orders have asked the assembly to allow us to use um, our local dollars with the anticipation of FEMA reimbursement. So, these are separate from the 156 million that was uh, afforded to the municipality and then primarily uh, put out to the community. There are other COVID related expenses that we ex uh, anticipate to get reimbursement for, but the timing is not coming in from FEMA as um, uh, diligently as we had hoped. So that, that, Im that uh, influences the the, the fund balance number as well. So we're working through that as well. We've already made one review with the administration on department requests. And so we're doing our best to get a, a, a balanced budget that has to be delivered to the assembly on Tuesday. And um, assembly member LaFrance, for your benefit, I just got an email from Desiree. She asked if I would have it available tomorrow. Um, I don't know if that's going to be a possibility because I, I still need some decisions from the administration because they're still waiting for some analysis from me and um, uh, hopefully we'll have them done by Monday, but they will be laid on the table items. They will not be on the addendum. It, it's just a matter of making sure that it's correct. So rather than give you something that's uh, not complete and then ask to do an S version with the introduction, we're going to do our best to make it right and then it will get introduced on the 13th of April. The, uh, and there will be public hearings, there will be assembly work sessions. Um, and then the assembly will be scheduled to act on the 27th of April. I am following the administration's decisions and the submission to the assembly next week. I am uh, planning to have a work session for an overview to the assembly next Friday. I think the time is 10 a.m. Um, so that will be a review of uh, kind of where we are. We're also calculating the mill rate. That mill rate calculation in, is influenced by how the bonds turn out and how Prop 4 turns out. So um, that will be a, a separate document for for that as well. And we're preparing as soon as we, I think by Friday, maybe early next, I think by Friday we'll have a good sense of how the bond propositions are turning out. So Lance, are you are you still there? It sounded like you kind of just dropped off a bit. Okay, let's see here. Bear with me. Oh, it looks like Lance is on hold. I don't know how that happened. Lila, are, are you able to, to fix that I'm in your I'm trying end? to Thank get a you. hold of him. <laughs> <laughs> hold on, just a moment. Okay. I think I lost you guys. Yay, there we go. Yeah, Lance, you, you were on hold somehow, so thank you. All right. I'm apologies. I, I was I getting another Teams call. Do we have any questions about um, about year one budget revisions? If not, we can move on to the performance measures. Yeah, I guess. Uh, yeah, let's go ahead and do that. Um, so I'm going to before I ask, well, go ahead, Lila, bring it up. Um, 
for the new members of the Budget Advisory Commission and, and maybe uh, as a reminder to those who have been on for a while, the, all departments have performance measures that they report quarterly um, in, to the assembly. And some of these performance measures, uh, one of them being ours, we actually do a, per, a performance measure once a year. And that measure is what we do is we send out a survey to the people that we serve, our customers, which are basically uh, department directors. Um, it would also include budget coordinators in the department. So it would be Desiree in the assembly office. It would be um, uh, Barbara Jones in the assembly as sort of their uh, director. It doesn't go to the assembly members. Um, it, it just goes to the people that we go to directly and we ask them a series of questions and in the past what we've done is we've kind of shown how well did we compare to last year in the responses and so th this this document will be what we present to the assembly uh, for first quarter pvrs performance and value and results measures for the office of management and budget when we do that in May. Um, I, I think we're going to, or maybe it will be later in April, but I just wanted to, uh, I think Lila shared this with you earlier, and I just kind of want to walk through how, how this has been sort of updated and how we use it. But, you know, the first, uh, the first question, so what you're looking at on the screen here is uh, a, this, this type of question has been asked over the past, well, six years, seven years. But, you know, how well are we communicating um, our expectations and our timelines to department heads? And so what we ask them is, starting at the, the, the colors, I would just say um, mean good. And then the, obviously the percentages, um, uh, they just show the percent change. So. For 2020, this is a performance from our last year's effort. How well are we communicating? You can see that 57% of the respondents say that they strongly agree on how we communicate our directions, our expectations, and our timelines. And then 35% of those people um, agree. And then you can and you can read on. The survey is sent out to about. I think it's like 90 to 100 individuals in this year. I think we got a response somewhere between 40 and 45, 40 individuals. So about half of the people that we sent it to, and we give them a little bit more than two weeks to respond at the end of February. So anyway, let's just highlight that. So it looks like we're doing a very good job cl clearly identifying what we're asking people to do. The next one has to do with turnaround time. and. I think the, the turnaround time, um, I still think is still very good overall. The thing that I would just recognize when I was conversing with my team is that you have to remember in 2020, we had a little extra on our plate in addition to our day jobs. So um, if, if the numbers, you know, moved a little bit in a way in which we weren't as timely, I think that um, I think that's understandable. So overall, I'm pretty, I'm proud of the, the OMB team and turning their stuff around. So, you know, basically 77% of the individuals thinking that our turnaround time, that's the stuff we get that their departments are asking us to do for them is on time. So go ahead, Lila, move down. Then, then this one here is, we hey, get a Lance. lot of, I'm sorry. Can can uh, we had a we had a question? So before we moved on to different metrics, I wanted to um, maybe voice this question, see if you could respond. So sure. Carla asked, uh, "What changed? Is it what changed? Is it because uh, communication was more important since face to face was not possible due to COVID?" That could be yes. Um, uh, and Carla, is that specifically related to um, which one? Well, yeah. It, yeah, it could to, be. Yeah, it, to the it, fact it, that, yeah. Yeah, it could have been, Carla. The The responses are anonymous to us, so we do not know which departments they came from or, you know, who actually responded. We don't know that. But I think, Carla, that, that 
could influence um, our, our turnaround time, yes. Well, congratulations on the improvement. I was just thinking, you know, I was wondering if you had changed the way you directed the department or what was going on. You know, I think last year we heard a little bit of that, you know, it, we we weren't as good at turning stuff around. So a couple things had happened. Um, we, we made a couple management choices that I'm thinking off the top of my head. One of them is, is that, you know, there would be times where we would ask for departments to uh, give us some follow up information on a budget transfer or personnel action um, and then, uh, you know, wait for them to hear back from us. So what we did is we, we I asked them what's in our queue and how long has it been there? And if we don't have a response, then um, I get a re I reach out to the director and I say, look, if you want to help us help you. Get us the information we're asking for because uh, maybe they forgot about it. And because if you can't, then, um, you know, uh, uh, we just want to move it. And I think that helped a little bit. But I, I think learning a little bit from the past, we've made better this year. So I'm going to thank ask, you. I, yeah, good question. So this one here, I think, is, you know, is the OMB team knowledgeable and helpful? Well, what I want to point about this one is, is that, yes, we get, in my opinion, we get a lot of calls about budget. But we also get a lot of calls about management issues. We get a lot of calls about financing and grants management and things that are not in our wheelhouse, but we know we know about. And so they call us and they reach out to us and they say, can you help us with this? And I think a lot of the growth has also been that people are getting used to using SAP and they call us to help navigate it. And we do one on ones. We help them individually to do that. And so I think a lot of the increase about people's comfort and willingness and then getting good customer service is a reflection of that one. And then um, the last one I have here, OMB's response to this to questions, you know, are we handled them quickly and efficiently? It's sort of related to, you know, are we timely? But I think the, the, the result is the same. Um, we, I think, you know, collectively that's, that's pretty good. Almost 90% of the people respondents think that we're, we're turning it around. They're not waiting on us to get their business done. So, um, again, a lot of kudos to to Lila and Marilyn and Christine and Marilyn for making it happen. I mean, there's those are the four that make it happen. So let's go on to the next one, Lila. Um, so this one has to do with um, reference materials and training. And I think what this one here, um, I want to talk about a little bit more. The other thing we allow departments to do and they're not put in here is that, uh, you know, what are the things that we can do better? What are the specifically the things that we can do better? And the two things that we got were um, a little bit of one on one on budgeting because we get a lot of new people. Can you take some time doing that um, before the budget gets started? Can you basically show us how you do the budget, basically how you make a cake? And, and that's similar to the presentation that I gave to Anna and James and that I give to new assembly members when they join the BAC or the assembly. They'd like us to do a little bit more of that. We're going to start that in May. So that, that's good as well. So let's go ahead. Um, and then intergovernmental charges. We got some work to do here. Um, basically, that's an explanation of how we do our overhead. I got a I got an opportunity to do that with a one department head that's been with us for about three years. He just he said, Lance, I just I need the simple country director version of how this works. And I just explained it to him. I said it's cost cause or cost payer. If you have a lot of documents going to the law department and purchasing, they're going to they're going to charge you more for their service than if you don't have a lot of stuff going to an internal audit. But how that actually happens and explaining it is um, something that we're going to uh, do a little better on. So there are some people that really get it, but we're going to make an effort to do better. And then overall, how, how do we how are we doing helping the directors and those budget people manage their budgets, develop their budgets, make the changes they want when they want to do them? Um, again, 80, what is that? 87% think we're doing a good or excellent job. And 
I am um, pretty amazed at uh, what five people can do when you have a city of 3,000 employees. So a lot of hats off to them. And then overall, I think, again, we're doing our, our overall performance is, 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 is doing well. And if it was getting worse, then we need some corrective action. So anyway, uh, I spend a little more time on this one because it's really the only time of year that you get to see or understand what we do and what people think about what we do. Obviously, I get a lot of um, supportive comments from the BAC, but this is from the people that we deal with every single day um, uh, with the department. So uh, again, this will be this, this information will be online. The format's a little bit different. Um, I think we got some guidance from uh, some suggestions from Marilyn and Christine and Courtney. Lila actually put this together in an illustration that looks good and and tells a good story. So that's where this one is. I think that's all that I have on the performance measures. Anyway, it's uh, I think as Carla mentioned, a lot had happened in 2020. So the fact that we're able to continue what we do and then help departments and others through the, the COVID process, as much involvement we had is uh, I'm pretty proud of my team. I'll just say it there. That's it. Thank you, Lance. And, uh, oh, yeah, big round of applause for your staff. That's quite amazing, the improvements that, you, that you've been able to make. So yeah, excellently done. The next on our agenda is uh, scheduling BAC department reviews. Do you want to speak to that, Lance? Yeah, the, the other thing, the last thing on the performance measures I wanted to point out is that I can't remember the year it was. Um, but, you know, I think in 2015 or in 20 and when we started 2015, I think we had seven or eight people in OMB. And then in 2017, we went to we went from six to five and we've been at five since that amount of time. Um, and so add that perspective into the performance measures is uh, uh, just adds a little bit of context to where we are. So regarding scheduling for your meetings for department heads, two parts. I'm, I really want to start doing that in May after I get back for first quarter revisions. Um, I, um, and so that's kind of my plan is to start reaching out those to those directors that um, and those departments that will be there. I mean, obviously, you guys have picked some departments that I'm aware that the director and the leadership is um, going to be changing. It's not so much as a much of the change of the administration is their commitment was to this year. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm obviously I'm aware Justin Chief Dahl is planning to retire. I think Chief Petrick from the fire department um, will be retiring, purchasing um, real estate. I think we've got a lot of leadership changes. These were not, I mean, these were uh, planned ahead. So, but I can tell you there's a lot of great folks in their deputy positions that won't slow us down. But just to be apprised of, of that. So I'm going to start looking at booking those. Probably uh, I'll start reaching out to them around the third week of April, and then I'll be coordinating with the BAC members to start doing those meetings in May and they'll probably occur in May and June. So that's where we are on those. Thanks very much, Lance. Any questions on um, on any of the scheduling and, and department reviews? I would just ask if uh, I think it, as you guys look ahead for your summer plans, if you are aware right now that you have blocks or weeks of time that you're going to be away, you can plan plan on those and we'll we'll plan around them. Just, just let Lila know if you've got them. And if you don't, then um, we'll work it week by week, day by day. Thank you, Lance. Appreciate that. All right, next on our agenda is audience participation, and I believe we have someone here from the public, uh, Peter Roberts, and I, I believe also that everyone was emailed. Um, Peter sent comments, uh, suggestion for revenue generation, 
And so I believe we got those shared out with everyone as well, um, Peter. So just wanted to let you know that, that that's already been been shared. Um, you've got audience participation is, is three minutes per person. So Peter, if you're there and able to speak, please come off mute and uh, feel free to share. Peter, I show you as as oh. muted. OK, I just figured out how to unmute it. Can you Excellent. hear me? Excellent. Yes, we can. Um, so if everyone uh, got the email, um, just open to questions. Um, I have some experience with the charitable gaming laws and uh, have been quite frustrated with the state and the city. Uh, well, not the city, but the state um, dealing with uh, it. And I think that uh, it, uh, deserves to be looked at, and I'm interested in your response to my email. Madam Chair, this is Carla. Yes, please. Go ahead, Carla. Um, could you please, not uh, the gentleman, I'm sorry, I forgot his name. Uh, could he give us a quick synopsis? I did read the email, but I don't know if everybody knows. I think what he's asking is that there be a tax imposed upon these charitable gamings, correct? No, no. That, oh. That's not right. Um, the office. Okay. Well, I guess if all you... I'm asking for it, uh, from uh, as a start is to find out how much net proceeds are paid by bingo halls and uh, pull tab operators uh, in the municipality of Anchorage, and that would be the figure that the the, the, the municipality of Anchorage could obtain if they applied for a gaming permit and then they would uh, just like every other uh, permittee or nonprofit that applies to an operator have their permit played they would have to get in line and maybe the operator would pick their permit uh, the city's permit and maybe they wouldn't and so then the next step if they felt the city felt that that was kind of strange that an operator could decide whether or not the city was more or less entitled to net proceeds than some church or a bowling league, then uh, they might want to consider asking the state to change the law so that um, the city could preempt a permit at, like, at an operator. So once the city got its permit, which it would automatically be granted because the city is entitled to one, um, I would argue that the city should have first dibs and could go to the front of the line and then the city would get the money and then various nonprofits could apply to the city for grants and have their activities vetted instead of a gaming operator just picking and choosing which organizations he or she wants to give money to. It's a very strange system and I don't think very many people know how it works. I mean, even in my email, there was a little bit of confusion uh, by your question that I want to tax. No, these gaming operators have sole authority to pick and choose which permits to play. And the municipality of Anchorage probably doesn't even know that it could apply for a gaming permit and would automatically get one. But then it would be in the odd position of having to like go to an operator and say, would you please pay my, play my permit? It's quite unusual, the whole setup. Thank you for that summary. I, I agree uh, with with Carla that I I had not made that connection. So I really appreciate your your summary there. When I read the email, I, I was I think similarly confused and, and thought similarly to what Carla thought about how how what you were suggesting. Uh, I see that we have a question from Anna. Please go ahead. Yeah, I guess um, so I did read your email and thanks for providing that. And I know um, a little bit about the gaming permits just from the alcohol license side, because I know a lot of them, uh, I, don't, I don't know how much that happens in Anchorage itself, but statewide, a lot of them are actually run by um, bars or package stores and then, um, and that they're considered the operator and then they provide the proceeds or some of the proceeds um, to the, whatever charitable cause they're working with, um, operating on their behalf. But I guess my, my question is, it seems like the beginning of your email, you were um, kind of concerned about the, you know, the social costs of of gaming generally, and I certainly have those concerns, um, you know, or you know, gambling. Um, but I just wonder. Then you were then you were kind of suggesting that we 
uh, maybe expand that or that um, Anchorage get more of that revenue. So I guess I'm just I'm I'm just curious, like what your position is on that generally. So the the gaming operator does not even need to pick a, a permittee approved by the state that's doing uh, so-called charitable work, which sometimes isn't even charitable, in the municipality of Anchorage. They can pick nonprofits from Kotzebue, and then money that would be gambled in Anchorage would be sent out of the city to someplace else, and that happens. And at the very least, I think that the, uh, the residents of each town where the gambling takes place are probably operating under the assumption that the money is at least going to stay inside their community. But it, it, it sometimes doesn't. I don't know how much. But once again, those operators have absolute power to pick and choose which permits to play and how much money to give each one. So it's very strange. I mean, they're not elected officials. Um, it, it's a very strange system. So, yeah, to answer your question about social costs, um, I think that people assume that uh, it's going to charity to offset the social costs of gambling in the town where it occurred. And if you go to the State of Alaska Department of Revenue Gaming Division website and look at the nearly 1,000 permits that are approved, there's a few. There are some that are uh, approved to towns, and those towns are smart enough to uh, have all of the money go to their general fund. And then they would spend the money uh, as they deem fit. They're usually the villages. Thank you for that that additional explanation. I I have one question, and we are kind of rolling this almost into the open discussion. So I um, want to make sure everybody has time for questions, but also recognize that that we're over that that three minutes there. Um, Peter, is this a, pol a a policy change that Anchorage would need to advocate for, or a regulatory change, or or neither? Is is the full process that you are describing already um, kind of with within the the current structure? So. By law, the municipality of Anchorage is already entitled to apply for a gaming permit. It could do so tomorrow, and then I would assume it would take like a month, and then it would be approved. There's no reason why the municipality of Anchorage uh, couldn't and shouldn't apply for a gaming permit. The, the problem is, once they do, there's no guarantee that permit is going to be played. So the answer to your question is policy would need to be changed if the city wanted to make sure that its permit would be played. They would have to they would okay. have to lobby the legislature and say we think this is kind of crazy that we have to go begging to an operator to have our permit played when they're playing the permit of some bowling league or church and we're holding our ta uh, taxpayers feet to the fire uh, demanding that they pay taxes when we could be in line for this money to either lower taxes or pay for essential services that are not being funded. Gotcha. Thank, thank you for that clarification. Uh, Tasha has a question. Tasha, sorry. Thank you. Um, I guess I would just comment that it's not just um, nonprofits that are eligible for gaming permits. Tribes are also, and my tribe, um, we have an Anchorage chapter and we have a gaming permit. Um, my tribe is based out of Juneau. They have a gaming permit, um, and we partnered with other, uh, tribes and did a multi-beneficiary to do pull tabs. And it was, I think, really challenging, but also I know that, um, folks that go to like Tudor Bingo, a lot of the people that I see there are people of color from the villages. So it makes sense to me that they would want to have their, um, gaming license based there smart move on their part like you said <laughs> but um i i don't know i i think that this is a great idea i think that any opportunity we have to um create revenue for our city that we should definitely explore it i also feel like there's some um organizations um for example you use tutor bingo and i know that um Special Olympics of Alaska holds their gaming permit there. 
that I don't think that um, they would qualify for many additional grants or resources outside of what they already obtain. So um, I guess I would say I want to look at this a little more. I think it's a great idea. I just want to make sure that I think of like unintended consequences that might happen if we do this. Thank you. So in response to that, I would say you can expect some pushback from these nonprofits that are already having their permits played. But I would add, I would say to them, what makes you more entitled to the money and to have your permit played than your neighbor down the street that says that they have a good cause and either their permit might not be being played or they're not getting as much money as, uh, as, as say, Special Olympics, for example. So I would say another option would be in, the city could very well say, we're going to take control of this money, this net proceeds, and we're going to put it into a trust fund or a fund. And nonprofits can apply to have for grants from this fund that is going to be that's going to be generating revenue from the net proceeds. The city would have the option of saying, look, we don't want the money to go into the general fund. We just want to have some say as to the merits of the programs that are being funded. And if, say, like the Brother Francis shelter is having its permit played. Um, uh, Peter, uh, Peter, being, I'm going to. I'm going to have to cut you off because we only have four more minutes um, for, for the rest of our agenda. So I, I really appreciate you being here and, and bringing this up. And I think there's it sounds like there's several people. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was the, the whole BAC that's interested in, in pursuing this further. Uh, so I really appreciate you bringing this to our to our attention and apologize for having to cut you off. But but we do have to move on to the to other agenda items. Understood. Um, one one request, though, um, and that would be to at least find out how much money is at stake. I, I think that's something that we can look into. So yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And thank you for the uh, the positive response from the group. Absolutely. OK, so we do have a, a very small amount of time now for open discussion. So I want to see if anyone has um, would like to touch on any of the topics that we've already touched on today. If there are any more thoughts on um, the ARPA funds or other funds coming out. Um, Anna, go ahead. Um, yeah, not not like substantive thoughts, but more a question about um, process, like like how if and how us as the BAC are going to be involved in that. Um, ARPA process and, and maybe it's more the longer term um, like like member LaFrance said um, that they have a short timeline now but longer term later. So just question to the group. I think that's a, a fantastic question and I know we have a, a handful of other people raising their hands. I I suspect this is something that that we're definitely going to need to have additional work sessions on um, just because of the the meat and substance of this of what we're being requested to do and the thoughtfulness that we need to need to put into it. I think um, Suzanne, you had your hand up first and then and then Tasha. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just very quickly, I just um, first of all appreciate the feedback from all of you and the points raised about the time frame. And I just wanted to stress that um, when I talked about getting the funds out quickly, I was referring to the 10 to 25 million out of the first tranche to go towards any immediate needs that weren't able to be addressed um, because of the wait lists from those first rounds of COVID-19 relief funds. So just wanted to stress that piece that the remaining funds will also include more deliberation and hopefully we'll know more about what the state and the federal programs will offer. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Suzanne. I, I appreciate that. And I, um, Anna, to speak to your, your question about like what will our process be, I think, you know, to say just that we'll have some more work sessions is is a, maybe a bit too small. So we we are working with the Muni. Um, there are two people who are working very hard on a, on a gap analysis and um, they we don't quite know how long that part of it's going to take just to be able to go through um the arpa and understand where is money specific like where do we have to fund uh, what restrictions are on it and then match that up with with the needs in anchorage and again like uh, to suzanne's point what is what do we expect the state is going to fund and those sorts of things so as we get a timeline on that as we hear back from them on how long they think it's going to take to to bring forth that very first uh analysis 
we'll I'll, I'll reach out um, and we'll try and set up the the first work session to just wrap our minds around that piece and then from there move on to okay so you know where is it that we want to fund what actually are those gaps um tasha yeah, I just was thinking about the second round of COVID um, funds, and I want to make sure that we have some attempt to collaborate with tribes in the area also, not just the state. I know that those are partnerships that we're trying to build up, but I think that we've all seen that they're going to get um, a separate pot of money as well. And one of the things I hate is one duplication of services and also the opportunity for some to hit up multiple places while others get none. <laughs> so um, I just want to make sure that at some point um, it's at least discussed if it's even possible for us to do that, right? I know it's a small group of people trying to reach out to a number of different folks, but just another area to make sure that we're not duplicating um, opportunities. Thank you for that. That's just a really wonderful point that you bring up. So thank you for that. Um, okay, so um, Suzanne, did you did you have another comment? Oh no, thank you, Madam Chair. I just haven't lowered that my is, hand. That is okay. I I just wasn't sure if I saw it leave and then come back. Um, okay, so we're right at the end of our timeline here. Um, sorry, I'm trying to see what's just at the end of the agenda. Make sure that we're on track. Okay, so. Um, next scheduled meeting is May 6th, and then we have um, our June 3rd that there's the suggestion to consider moving it to June 10th, and then we have one on July 1st. Um, again, not considering in there what our special work sessions might be, and, and we'll just kind of do those with a doodle poll, I, I believe, and, and try and catch as catch can as the information comes in to, to start working through gap analysis and figuring out what will the BAC's recommendation be related to these um, ARPA funds. Any any comments, um, Lance, Layla? I have nothing to add. Thank you, Madam Chair. Awesome. Any uh, BAC, any any comments, questions, etc.? And if not, can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. This is Nolan. Awesome. Do we have a second? Second, Tasha. Thank you both. All right, with that, we are adjourned. Thank you all for your fantastic participation today. It's been a really fantastic meeting. Thank you. Thank you.